Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Harbi Sohal, and he is an assistant professor and lead preclinical lab at the Center of Bioelectronic Medicine at the Feinstein Institute in New York. It's actually really funny because he seems to have basically worked with all of my previous guests. <laughs> he worked with uh, Dr. Ed Boyden of MIT. He did a postdoc there and Andrew Jackson in Newcastle University in England. And also he knows another person that I know back from my bachelor's, Dr. Lauren Reith. Uh, so it was very interesting stuff. He he is uh, he's quite a rising star. He's, he's uh, quite uh, well-renowned or quite well-awarded, I guess. Uh, he was recently on the Forbes 30 Under 30, and he also is like 29 or something like this and is on a tenure-track uh, professorship. So, so he works with chronically implanted devices and allowing them to be recorded for a longer amount of time. So this is a main theme of this podcast is glial scarring. So he works to try to reduce this glial scarring. He's also worked with optogenetics and now he's very interested in the vagus nerve in integration, basically bioelectronic medicine. So being able to control the heart rate or inflammatory response based on being able to control this nerve. So basically he's hitting on all the, the big things in in this field, the big trendy things, and the things that have a future, honestly. Um, so take a listen. This is a very good episode, and we'll talk more on the other side. Basically, it started with me being frustrated with uh, the neuroscience, my neuroscience course at Nottingham in the UK. And I, and I realized that, you know, the brain is pretty much a really complex system. And we don't really have the technology out there to really understand what the brain is doing. And without the technology, you know, you, we can't further our knowledge of the brain. It's a pretty much a very, very physical, dynamic system. There's a lot of connections and different regions of the brain do different things. So I was just searching online uh, for my next step. And from my neuroscience background, I, I stumbled upon the brain machine interface sort of project at uh, at Newcastle, and then I started to read uh, up uh, about the uh, about what Stuart Baker and Andrew Jackson were doing. So then I found them, um, and then I started to stalk them a bit online. And then they had this really interesting project on flexible interfaces. So yeah, uh, then I ended up applying, and then uh, as soon as I interviewed uh, with them, I realized it's a great place to do uh, neurotechnology development, especially in the UK at the time. And also, I realized that many of their students were on the uh, high trajectory to go to uh, good things, and they've already been doing some great things. So I, I knew that they'd be perfect mentors for me uh, to uh, further my career also. That's interesting. So how did you find out that the others were, were on the upward trajectory as well? Like, did you just talk to them or did you just somehow like they had like an alumni list and, and then you could see what en happened with them or something or what? Well, I actually visited the lab and everyone, you know, had a great outlook uh, in their lives. So everyone was doing some great stuff. Um, uh, Stuart Baker's lab and Andrew Jackson's lab were uh, some of the only non-human primate labs uh, in the UK. So I, I knew they're very niche as well. But also, the fact that they go to international conferences from the UK every single year, and um, it was it was just great to see that you know the, their reputation was out there, and uh, for all the students to grow and to uh, get to the next level, they also need to meet people in the field. So there's a combination of good mentorship as well as uh, the opportunities to meet and collaborate with uh, new people from, from all over the world. Wow, this is really interesting. So this is actually, this is kind of the, the spot that I'm at right now. You know, I'm, I'm applying for PhDs, I finished my master's, but I, I want it to be like the perfect one. And so I've actually turned down some like imperfect ones. But I don't know, like I also I also recognize exactly like you, like it's it's very important who you go with, what project you go with, because I mean, that not only determines the next three years, but it also determines your trajectory for the next five or 10 years after that. Um, so what would you recommend for me? Would you, because I, I've been kind of like blindly, you know, doing the online applications, but I 
I also see, I also think that's a little bit useless because the people don't know you, you know, it's just, it's just a name on a piece of paper versus actually knowing you and, and, uh, you know, being, knowing if they would get along with you for three years. I mean, they're pretty much, you're going to be family, right? For three years. So, uh, would you recommend maybe going to see them and, and, you know, doing interviews in the lab or, or what else would you recommend for at this point? Yeah, so I would strongly recommend uh, visiting the lab, so even reaching out to the postdocs who are currently in the lab and the graduate students to get an overall feel for the lab. But I have to say, once you step into a lab, you know that's the right lab for you. If they're interested in you and you know you just get a great vibe from the lab, you you know you're in the right place. Okay, cool. And and also, of course, you have to be uh, very interested in the topic area as well, right? So. A combination, I would say, the perfect combination is you're very interested in the research they do, uh, and you you know you feel at home as soon as you get to the lab. Because yes, a PhD is very very demanding, you know, as a as a next step up. And like you said, you need to basically feel like a family and build a family culture. Because at the end of the day, that lab will be your support network for the next uh, few years. PhDs aren't easy, and you have to work towards them. So. Yeah, my uh, master's thesis advisor basically said that a PhD is like a marriage, you know, so you have to at least like the, the person you're with or the project and everybody. And uh, what you're saying, too, is, is like you just kind of know. And so maybe like with finding a wife or, you know, a partner or something like this is uh, you just know. And it's not kind of like, oh, yeah, sure. Why not? It's like, yes, 100 percent. And let's do this, you know. And yeah, that that's uh, interesting. Maybe I should just go with my gut with this kind of stuff. <laughs> Also, I mean, it's a bit like uh, you know dating, and you know when you you know when the date is going well. It's a, that's the only analogy that I can give. You can, you know when the date is going to go well, your first date's going well, or you know it's not going to go anywhere. So that's the analogy I kind of give uh, to uh, you know finding the perfect lab, and definitely visit the lab and speak to the students and the postdocs. And you know the great thing about uh, most American labs is they keep an up to date website, so you can see where the alumni have gone as well. And feel free to reach out to the alumni of the lab to see what they what they thought and you know how much uh, the advisors helped in the career. Exactly, because you're choosing them as much as they're choosing you. So, what was it? What was uh, the features of this uh, of this partner that that when you saw it, you're just like, yeah, I want to go on a second date. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, for me in Newcastle, it was the opportunity to actually go from you know the biological sciences into uh, neuroengineering. So. Um, it was a great thing. So the uh, talker, it was like kind of a bi-directional relationship. My advisors really believed in my ability, so they allowed me to go into microfabrication, so building, you know, devices and miniature devices for the brain. And it was a pretty unique combination. So I knew it was a perfect marriage because I could take my existing skill set and also go into a new realm of the physical sciences to really start to marriage, uh, you know, my knowledge of neuroscience as well as uh, material science. And I have to say, I'm one of the ones that did this backwards. So many people in neurotechnology, they normally uh, go the other way around from the you know the physical science background into neuroscience. So I, I knew it was a you know it was a great feature as soon as I realised that I could do that. Yeah, definitely. The, the micro the microfabrication is uh, quite a rare thing, and it can be very very expensive. Like it's it, there's a reason that not many places have it. So so if you could briefly describe what what did you help with over there? What was the, what was the project and and uh, how did you you worked with uh, long term uh, electrodes? So so what was kind of the solution to be able to have them uh, be stable over the long term? So we wanted to address something known as uh, micro motion related trauma. And this is where, back in the day, silicon technology was mainly the electrodes you implanted over a long time. And there have been some great work with, let's say, the Utah array in humans and for brain-machine interfaces overall. But what we were interested in at that time is how can we minimize this foreign body response that occurs in the brain uh, and actually make our electrodes last longer, but also not damage the brain regions that we're trying to study. So we can really start to study ground truth uh, uh, signals and uh, coming from the brain without the influence of the foreign body response. So what we ended up doing was pretty quite unique design-wise. What we ended up doing uh, was uh, interfacing the uh, with the brain, especially the sensory motor regions, with flexible technology. So we took really flexible substrates. Uh, in our case, it was Paralene C. And typically... What ends up happening in the in the in silicon case is that uh, these probes are too stiff to move with the brain. So you can imagine the brain kind of like jello. It's 
floating around. It's moving in all directions. And if you have jello in a pot, you know, you can shake it around. That's the motion of the brain. It's moving in omni directions. So if you interface with something stiff, you're going to damage the brain region that you want to record from over time. So to put this into perspective, the human brain at the tip point of an electrode can uh, move up to two millimeters where the tip resides. So our solution was that we didn't want a sharp electrode. A sharp electrode is needed to insert into the brain. What we did was we essentially put a spring into the brain. So we had strain relief on our flexible probe, and then we had a rounded recording uh, uh, site with three electrodes protruding. This was our first generation. And then we interfaced uh, these electrodes uh, with the brain. So essentially what we did was anchor our recording sites into place with a ball anchor, and the motion of the brain was being counteracted by our spring-like sinusoidal uh, shank, which has strain relief on it. And this minimizes the motion of the electrode relative to the brain tissue, and therefore you know, decreased the foreign body response. So that was the whole premise behind uh, making these electrodes. And these electrodes were made um, over in the Newcastle clean rooms. And it was a pretty fun time making these electrodes. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, definitely. I mean, glial scarring um, is is a huge theme of this podcast, and and that I, I would argue is is maybe one of the big things that's stopping stopping everything. So basically, having this foreign body response, the body attacking the the implants, and you know, basically making them unusable is is huge. So you basically more or less like put shock absorbers on it, something like this, right? So so almost like in a car, you don't want to feel exactly what's on the ground. You, you want a little bit of a, a disconnect between between the ground and and uh, your butt. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Is uh, um, at the time it was, a, it was kind of a, a pretty cool design because no one's thought of it. And then you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, someone should have thought of this by now. Um, it, it was a pretty cool moment that we put this into practice. But that is a concept of the design. It's pretty much having a spring in the brain that can move and accommodate the motion of the brain while holding the anchor point of the electrode in place. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so so after this, you went to MIT, right? What what were you doing over there? And and you're uh, working with the previous guest, Ed Boyden, right? Yes. So I had the uh, you know great lucky opportunity to join Ed Boyden's lab over at MIT, and I worked on uh, a a couple of things. Uh, well, more than a couple of things. So first of all, they were very interested in this flexible technology. So we we were in Newcastle, one of the first groups to show that we could stably record from the rabbit cortex for up to two years. And we showed that overall the foreign body response was actually decreased uh, around our probes uh, compared to, uh, you know, standard conventional microwires that we uh, tested against. And I do believe we were one of the first groups to actually have a test electrode where we, com- we were comparing uh, two electrode types, one of the novel kind and one of a kind that... Uh, you know, uh, the likes of Mikhail Nikolaelis uh, ended up using. So, of course, there was interest uh, when I went over to MIT with these probes and what they could uh, offer. So this is where I actually ended up joining uh, the labs of Ed Boyden and Bob Desimon. And the thing is, because we are interfacing these probes with the rabbit cortex, we really wanted to, the next step was to actually increase their length and the number of sites uh, to so that we can interface to multiple brain regions involved, let's say, in movement or or even in uh, visual processing. So that was one of my projects. The other projects, and I have to be uh, very grateful for Ed for allowing me to do this, I ended up going into uh, optical technology and optogenetics and uh, more on the uh, hardware creation side. So we can really start to stimulate uh, individual cells with uh, using light. And I also expanded my uh, uh, number of electrodes that I ended up making, the flexible technology, to uh, incorporate some uh, technology to record from the the bird brain, the songbird brain, uh, in a collaboration with uh, Michael Fee. And I also have been involved in endovascular um, interfacing using flexible electrodes. So I I grew two things. One was my flexible uh, electrode technology capabilities, as well as the opportunity to go into uh, optogenetics and hardware control. Wow. Sounds like you were really busy. (laughs) It was a pretty busy uh, post-op. It was pretty fun because I learned a lot of things uh, in the group and also from Ed. 
Okay. Yeah. And, and so, so now, you know, we were talking before the recording, you're also like a wunderkind, a little bit like uh, Ed, where you've been on this upward trajectory and you're 29 and become a professor now. I'm 28 and <laughs> sitting, sitting here recording this, this podcast in Ukraine. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, uh, how, how did you get to this uh, professorship then too at Ed Feinstein? So it was pretty, uh, it was pretty great, actually. So we, uh, one of the collaborations that I didn't mention because I kind of anticipated this question was the one with the Feinstein Institute. So the Feinstein Institute, we were collaborating on a project to get a chronic recording from the mouse vagus nerve. And I met up with Kevin Tracy before the Center of Bioelectronic Medicine was formed. And he came up to me uh, because he, he uh, through Ed, you know, Kevin Tracy and Ed Boyden were talking. And then he, he came up to me when I visited and said, can you make some of these devices? We need a device that chronically interfaces with the cervical vagus nerve in the mouse because we want to find out long-term computations of the inflammatory reflex, which is pretty cool. Uh, the inflammatory reflex being that you can actually uh, sense the inflammatory response in, in multiple diseases through the vagus nerve. So that's where the collaboration started, and I ended up making devices for the Feinstein, and all went well, and I really enjoyed uh, working with the Feinstein. And there came an opportunity when Chad Belton took over the center to become a faculty member of the Feinstein, and with my long-term uh, research goals, as well as uh, bioelectronic medicine, we ended up uh, you know, coming to a, a, an agreement where I could actually join as a faculty member for the Center for Bioelectronic Medicine. So I always say to people, or, or also be a good collaborator because you never know how a good collaboration is going to end up. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, these these people can open doors and uh, you're working on the, the vagus nerve stuff over there, like more or less bioelectronic medicine, right? Yes. So um, I actually over there lead the preclinical devices lab uh, at the Center for Bioelectronic Medicine. And we try to learn from our preclinical models uh, the best way to make devices. Um, so it's kind of a backward from the goal approach, which uh, I really did learn in Edge Lab, uh, to take uh, you know the physiological system into account and make uh, devices for long-term interfacing. And for long-term interfacing, I am still using flexible technology. Very cool. So uh, what's going to be coming up in the next few years? What, uh, what are you working on now? So right now in time, uh, we're working on implantable technologies and the chronic interfacing technologies. A really cool thing that has been shown is that through vagus nerve stimulation, which is a, a, a peripheral nerve, that in, and this has been shown in clinical trials, um, that if you uh, stimulate the vagus nerve in late stages of drug-resistant uh, uh, arthritis, that you can actually alleviate the symptoms involved. So this is uh, a finding that uh, Kevin Tracy from the Feinstein Institute was very, very instrumental in finding in his preclinical models. And it's really sparked the interest in bioelectronic medicine, where you can actually interface to nerves, stimulate them, record from them in a closed loop fashion to actually decrease the side effects involved in, in taking drugs. So let's say, for example, um, for rheumatoid arthritis, some of the, uh, the uh, strongest drugs out there actually suppress your immune system to the point where you're more resistant to infection. So there's a lot of interest in, interest in just stimulating the vagus nerve to decrease um, the inflammatory uh, responses in this. But what we're doing now is we're interfacing with a whole host of uh, nerves. But to do that, especially in humans and in preclinical models, you need uh, novel technology. So we're developing novel technology strategies for chronically decoding as well as stimulating in in uh, the in peripheral nerves, especially the vagus nerve. And we're also working on increasing the amount of recording. So, so classically, from the nerves, uh, you end up only recording to take sensory information out or even motor information from the nerves on classically a handful of sites. But now what we realize is some of these nerves are pretty, pretty busy. Let's say the vagus nerve controls anything from breathing, uh, the heart, uh, you know, the inflammatory reflex. And we need more sensors to actually realize what's happening. So we're upscaling the number of uh, sensors or uh, electrical recording sites, as well as making flexible technology so we don't end up damaging the nerve over time when we're interfacing. Um, yeah, one final thing is if we spread out our contacts, um, you know, we can essentially use uh, something like in cable theory where you have propagating uh, um, 
propagating activity along a nerve, and we can actually start to determine what fiber types are involved in the propagation and therefore have more targeted uh, therapeutic stimulation. Wait, can you explain this? I don't think I understand. Okay, so when a... um, Yeah, sure. So in a nerve, or just think of a very long piece of conducting string, if a, if a signal is propagating, what you need to do um, is spread out your recording site. So you're actually picking up the same feature on the recording sites or different sites. And then at a given time, if you uh, have the same compound action potential uh, being picked up, there will be a phase shift in the compound action potential. And if your sites are spaced along the nerve, then you can really start to determine the conduction velocities of these uh, compound action potentials. And therefore, you can deduce uh, through the conduction velocity what fiber types have been involved in specific responses in disease models and um, you know in normal models as well. So the analogy here is the classical uh, studies where people used to take nerves out of the body and uh, put uh, t- three electrodes, one in the middle and one on either end to see uh, what happens when you electrically stimulate or even put chemicals on, onto the nerve. Okay, okay. So uh, because the nerves go at different speeds, so like pain is the fastest one, and then and then I don't know, like hunger or whatever, I don't know, something something different. They might they don't need to travel as quickly. Uh, you can figure out which one it is based on based on the speed, something like this. And the speed of the nerves of the different types of nerves is is well known, something like this. Yeah. So yeah, something like that. The nerve fibers. Pain is actually surprisingly, you know, there's fast pain and then there's so slow pain. So it's, uh, depending on the sensational pain. It's, uh, it's actually uh, transmitted by different fibers. So, but if we have more of these sensors and you can pick up more signals, you can imagine with something like the vagus nerve being involved in so, so many things, the more sensors you have, the more likely you are to get a correlation with what you're actually looking for. Okay. But still, um, still by having more sensors along the, along the bundle, you don't really know where inside the bundle those nerves are, right? Yeah, so in the in the nerve bundle, you don't know where these uh, you know these fibers are, but you can start to deduce that. And in fact, um, you know that in humans, uh, one of my colleagues actually at the Feinstein uh, Institute, Lauren Reith, he's working on the penetrating uh, Utah array to record from nerves. So if you have uh, individual electrodes at depth into a nerve, you could do what we do with the brain and start to get some layer-like information by uh, trying to. Uh, interface to these fascicles in the nerve. Wow, that's that's amazing, actually. I know Lauren Reith also from uh, University of Utah. <laughs> we were just writing a few months ago when he was moving over there. <laughs> Man, you, you seem to know everybody in this field that I know. <laughs> It's pretty great, yeah. So the Fancy Institute uh, hired uh, Lauren Reith as an associate uh, professor, and he uh, has taken over the microfabrication laboratory there. So, so it's a pretty cool Small team. world. <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah, that, that's really interesting. So basically, uh, with this, okay. So, so when we when uh, when we can, um, I don't know, stop this or something like this, or when we when we figure out exactly where in the bundle and which uh, signals uh, saying what, then we would potentially be able to control the inflammatory response and a host of other different things, heart rate and pressure, blah blah blah, blah all this kind of things, uh, based on um, bioelectronics, right? Something like this. So based on bioelectronics and interfacing to, like the, the example I gave was with Vegas nerve, but you can imagine a scenario where we're interfacing to multiple nerves and perhaps we can start to you know decode other, other things. Like a concept that uh, we have in mind is a good analogy. It's like an implantable chip that actually tells you perhaps when you need to go to the doctor or when something's awry to get uh, better treatment through uh, chronic monitoring, but also... Uh, you know, just to get a, uh, just to give the the doctors informed uh, diagnosis uh, a lot more than just taking acute readings. Like, let's say, let's check your blood pressure, let's uh, run these clinical tests. So that's uh, what we're really aiming to do in bioelectronic medicine. Yeah, the the I guess the example that comes to my mind right now is I remember a few years ago I was in a car and it was kind of a new car of a neighbor and it, it had like sensors and it said like how, what the pressure was of the tires. So it's like, oh, 28 PSI, you know, and so it would be able to say which tires are low from the inside and, and you wouldn't even have to like go outside or try to feel if the, the car is driving strange or something like this, if it's too high or too low. So this would be kind of like this, but for everything. So hunger, thirst, inflammation, heart rate, pressure, blah, 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 theoretically. And uh, the you basically basically have a readout of all these different things and uh you know how how 
I don't know how sleepy you are, maybe. <laughs> and uh, you, you have a percentage or something like this, like The Sims. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's what we're hoping for, uh, to have a read app. Also, having control to, uh, in a closed loop fashion, um, to control if something does go wrong, that perhaps we can, uh, you know, decrease, uh, you know, certain uh, symptomology. Let's say, for example, multiple disorders have an infl inflammatory component. Any brain disorder has an inflammatory component. Any uh, you know, injury has an inflammatory component. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, if we could control inflammation um, we, and we know when something is going wrong, then perhaps we can have a better targeted treatment strategy through uh, specific targeting. Exactly. So it's almost also like a, a cheat mode on The Sims. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's like uh, we already know what's going wrong uh, through, you know, all these nerve signals that are coming out. And, you know, we could now fix it. And I think that's the overall goal of bioelectronic medicine. And it's pretty exciting to be involved while the field is still pretty young. Yeah, fascinating. And so what, what kind of a time frame do you think this, uh, this cheat mode of The Sims will happen? Like 5, 10, 100 years? I would say within the, um, you know, next five years, we might have the technology out there to help us do this. But then understanding the biological processes and the best way to decode these signals and, you know, make all of the devices last a, a long time in the body. That could be anywhere between 10 and 15 years. Okay, so like a beta version or something like this, or um, like the first uh, first human trials maybe in five years and then and then in 10, 15 years more, a little bit more mainstream? I, I would say the first, uh, you know, human trials between five and 10 years, yes. Interesting. Um, do you have any recommendations on who we should talk to or what we should read? Sure. I, I would say, you know, even a lot of information is actually contained on, uh, you know, the Feinstein Institute website on bioelectronic medicine, and that gives a lot of links, uh, stuff in the field. I also, I do recommend uh, just searching for the term bioelectronic medicine on, on Google. There's a lot of uh, groups now that are interested, but there's also existing technology that can be used um, in the field as well. And we've all heard the term of neuromodulation, and neuromodulation has been around for you know decades now so you know even some of the older technology and closed sleep stimulation uh, is very applicable for bioelectronic medicine so there's a lot of stuff out there and even i would recommend people just listening to these uh, the po podcasts that you're putting putting together they're pretty informative because every single podcast i've listened to can actually be uh used in the context of bioelectronic medicine Definitely. I think it's much easier to, you know, bring up some old research, dust, dust a book off rather than write a new book, uh, you know, from scratch. And I was thinking about this too. I, I wonder, um, there's a lot of wisdom in like Chinese medicine and even like uh, acupuncture and all this kind of stuff. It's like a lot of the nerves and stuff are, are kind of mapped out on there. Uh, do you think that would be a good place to start and then maybe like refine it from there? Or, or ha have you guys been using this data as well? Yeah, so uh, that, that's a great way to start, um, you know, understanding what uh, different nerves do. And it's always interesting uh, learning um, or reading about uh, acupuncture. But what we really need to start doing in the field is actually mapping what, what uh, different projections go to which organs and which fiber types go to specific organs or target regions. That's uh, not really being done. Um, Per se, I think people have started to do that, and that's what we really need in the field, is just to do a massive map of where everything goes in preclinical models as well as in, in the human. So we really start to uh, you know make the technology that uh, we need for bioelectronic medicine for targeted stimulation and recording. Um, uh, uh, something that would be really great in this is, um, you've already uh, covered this, is optogenetics could be a great tool and some of the genetic tools for mapping for sure. Well, I think it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. I mean, you can't really map it until you have a good device. And, you know, you can't really have a good device until you map it. But uh, what do you think, like, maybe maybe build a device that, that's really good and, and, you know, long lasting and, you know, find the, the nerves within the bundle and then, you know, basically crowdsource it and, and have the scientists all over the world basically figure it out and, and get famous from, from mapping where the different nerves go in the, in the organs. Uh, do you think that's, that's the likely way it's going to happen? Or what do you kind of foresee? Yeah, so it, there has to be progress on both sides, like on the interface side and the mapping side. So you, you can imagine if you come up with the, the a really good chronic interface, uh, you can essentially change the layout of your sensors or incorporate new sensors as long as you have, 
you know, a physical design that ends up working. But then on the other hand, where do we place these sensors? What is the optimum layout on the nerve? And this will pretty much, or even uh, where to actually physically interface and which nerves to interface uh, will be found out uh, through uh, biology. And, you know, the other people around the world, including us, uh, mapping, you know, the specific connections. So I foresee like it has to be tackled in both directions for bioelectronic medicine uh, to be successful. And I know uh, we're, we're particularly doing that at the Feinstein Institute. We're, we're tackling it from the biology standpoint, molecular standpoint, as well as the device standpoint. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Integrated solution and, and using lots of lots of different physics tricks and everything like this, right? Um, so, kind of the last question: what, what motivates you in this field? Like, why why are you doing this? And and I mean, you know, we were in the Forbes thirty under thirty, so obviously you're motivated. Uh, what what gets you up in the morning, and and uh, why especially bioelectronic medicine? So, um, so my overall interest in neurotechnology was sparked uh, due to uh, personal reasons and. Um, uh, the reason was, when I was younger, my mother suffered a stroke uh, when I was 12 years old. And I started reading about the field and really, uh, you know, I was trying to understand what was happening to my own mother. And then I realized, you know, there's a greater problem overall of just uh, paralysis and paralysis existing. And then I wanted to find out ways to potentially, uh, you know, mitigate this or help people with paralysis. And uh, then I stumbled upon brain machine interface. So brain machine interface has always uh, been of interest to me because of uh, personal reasons. Uh, also, unfortunately, around about, uh, I would say, eight years back, and what got me into bioelectronic medicine specifically, my father passed away due to uh, something known as uh, multiple organ uh, dysfunction syndrome, better known as sepsis. And Kevin Tracy was one of the uh, uh, instrumental people working on uh, sepsis studies as well as uh, you know trying to make devices to make uh, people with sepsis uh, survive longer and really I've been personally motivated by personal uh, things that have happened to close people in my family and uh, you know that's something strong enough to get me up every morning to try to understand and try to uh, essentially help uh, others out there that might be suffering, uh, you know, from multiple disorders. And uh, this is what has got me into bioelectronic medicine pretty big. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, I think that's probably the strongest motivation I've heard so far on the show. Uh, yeah, that's that's huge. You know, you try to try to prevent for others, you know, what happened to you. And uh, yeah, sorry to hear that, that both of your parents were affected like this, and, you know, n- neurophysically or, you know, in a way that potentially in 20 years could be could be quite easy to solve, almost like an antibiotic pill or something like that. Yeah. And I mean, this is where, you know, I, I've basically gone across the field and you know, have seen, uh, you know, hopeful technologies out there that could work um, in the long run. And I really do think bioelectronic medicine is one of the things that, uh, you know, could help, uh, especially in the, in the uh, up, up, and, up and coming years. Um, uh, and also just to decrease side effects uh, associated with taking pills. Yeah, definitely. That's that's something. I mean, uh, along the course of this this podcast, I, I I originally was thinking like, oh, brain machine interfaces, and I was thinking about calling the show brain machine interface podcast, but uh, kind of change it to neural implants so to be a little bit more broad. But actually, that's also something I've realized is like this seems much more interesting to me in the end and much more feasible in the in the shorter term. Um, and again, it could also be much more impactful. I mean, yeah, I I, I don't really like the pharmaceutical industry. I don't like the idea of putting chemicals uh, in your body anytime I mean you're in the US so anytime you know there's a there's an ad on TV for like some kind of drug or pharmaceutical it's it's followed by this huge list of side effects it's like is it even worth it to take it you know for a restless leg syndrome should I like have suicidal thoughts and like not eat and have a low sex drive I don't think that's worth it but uh, you know so theoretically with this bioelectronic medicine you could get around it I mean still it's a little bit crude and it's not as you know I don't know integrated as like eastern medicine but it's definitely a step closer yeah i always say if we know um how to read signals from the body and understand them and where to look that we can have more informed treatment strategies and diagnosis so that's uh, the beauty i think of bioelectronic medicine that we're trying to map intricate pathways as well as treat those pathways with novel technology so uh like i said in the next next 10 to 15 years i can definitely see 
uh, this being a pretty cool thing to be involved in. Yeah, so so you're kind of saying like this will uh, quantify the the qual the qualitative nature of medicine right now. Like kind of right now, a doctor looks at you and is like, "Oh, you look you you look swollen, or you look you don't look so good," <laughs> and based makes a diagnosis based on that. Uh, maybe does some tests here and there, but but uh, like this with this theoretically, you could have much more uh, better numbers and and a history of numbers, and you, the the doctor would theoretically know much better what's going on and and a history as well, something like this, right? Yeah, so it would be more of an informed diagnosis. It's, uh, imagine like having a wireless blood pressure cuff that takes your blood pressure, and you know you go to the doctor. It's like, hi guys, this is my real readings, not the you know. The, so some people actually suffer from white coat syndrome. They go into the you know the emergency room or go to their doctor and automatically have high blood pressure. Um, you know, I have seen cases where they've been misdiagnosed to high blood pressure because of uh, certain cases like this. And, you know, you can imagine that if you have something recording signals or even vital signs over a long time and logging it, let's say, to your iPhone or something similar that then doctors can actually tap into, then you have, uh, you know, more informed diagnosis and you can actually track over time what's actually happening and get the best treatment possible. Exactly, the most accurate treatment. So, okay, um, I know this is outside of your expertise, but I was I was telling a girl about this one time, and she's like a Kazakhstani or no Kyrgyzstani hacker, you know. And she's like, "Oh, this sounds great! Like I could hack right into it." And I'm just like, "Oh man, this sounds really scary! Like like you could theoretically have your heart rate in the hands of Russian and Kyrgyzstani hackers." What do you think about this? Well, yeah, there, there's been you know a lot of debate on the neural ethics of implants and. One thing that we do need to do is increase the security of these implants and find a solution to incorporate security, especially on wireless devices. But I think this will go hand in hand when you know the technology develops. As far as uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm concerned. I don't think you know, in the grand scheme of things, with the total number of, let's say, cardiac implants and uh, pacemakers and DBS devices, there have been that many hacking of these devices because I think you know people. Do want to see you know the optimum treatments for these people? Um, of course, it'll be inevitable with more implants uh, as a potential problem. But I think uh, uh, there are solutions out there where we can make the devices uh, safer. Yeah, definitely. I, I would say, yeah, I think I think I heard something like one percent of um, you know agents are like negative or like uh, I don't know, like actively trying to hurt or steal or something like this. So maybe also the field is not big enough to really get a, a critical mass of these negative agents that really want to take advantage of you know whatever whatever's going on. And I don't really know what what would be the benefit of like killing somebody theoretically like by just stopping their heart rate. Maybe maybe ransom or something like this. Actually, actually that would be a good way to do that. Assassinations. Yeah, so I think um, the thing is, like, uh, security of devices and implants will, you know, naturally uh, come to the forefront once they're being uh, used a lot more and more in uh, real day life. And you know, there, there have been some great, uh, you know, security encrypting technology out there, um, you know, for computers making sure some of that information is safe. If you have a look at the probability of statistics of and the amount of data that we actually store on servers actually being hacked is pretty pretty low overall. So I think something like this has to, uh, uh, you know, come to the forefront when we start using these devices uh, more. And then, of course, if you have something encrypted, then uh, some of the wireless solutions out there will also have a, a greater power drain on them. So, you know, that's something for people who are working with wireless technology to, uh, to figure out. And I'm sure the field will come together and there's some great people working there, out there to get, uh, you know, wireless uh, technology out there, as well as, uh, you know, making sure that these devices are safe, both in biology, as well as, uh, you know, safety wise and hacking. Yeah, exactly. So you're content with uh, leaving the experts deal with it when, when the time comes, when it's when it's necessary to deal with it, something like this? Yeah, so I think we need to start having these conversations, but I do believe that, you know, the progress that we have made in encrypting and security measures will also come into play uh, once these devices go uh, mainstream. Cool. Well, uh, Harbi Sohal, thank you so much for coming on. This has been very informative. You've had a, a very interesting uh, career track, and I, I hope it will continue. If people want to find out more about you or uh, contact you, how do they do this? Uh, they can uh, go directly on to the Feinstein website um, uh, and find my email and my details there. But my email address is uh, hs uh, 
uh, sorry, it's hsohal at uh, northwell.edu, and I'm always happy for people to contact me on, on my Twitter feed as well as uh, uh, through LinkedIn. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be on. Hey guys, yeah, I really enjoyed this. This was uh, very interesting. I mean, uh, <laughs> I was, I was a little bit, uh, I don't know, jealous, or I'm just like, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? And uh, this guy's just such on such a fast path. And uh, you know, Forbes thirty under thirty, and. Uh, tenure track professor at age 29 i'm just like wow this is unbelievable and i think i think uh, ed boyden uh was was in this kind of position as well but for some reason i i saw him more of like way up there you know like i'm not i, I can't even i can't even he's superhuman something like this uh, obermensch and uh you know i can't really compete with this so um yeah maybe maybe it's uh maybe it's not so difficult maybe really just follow your follow your instincts and and you know like he said be with good people and and follow um you know good leadership and you know be be inspired by the good people so i think well if i do a little bit of self promotion here uh the podcast is a great way to do this so you can you can really find maybe the the biggest people or the people that you uh find the most interesting and you know just connect with them and and you know person uh, for a person to be a mentor they don't have to be sitting next to you all day they can be a virtual mentor and it can literally be just 10 emails over the course of a year or something like this and that could be good enough for mentorship so uh really it's it's not that um big of a thing, I guess. But yeah, I found this very interesting. So as I said, I, I really like the, the Feinstein Institute and and basically the direction it's going with the bioelectronic medicine. I think this is kind of the future. And again, like this is a, a very big theme of this podcast is the glial scarring. So these these uh, long living uh, electrodes and, and basically very soft electrodes too are are very important. So he's he's kind of hitting on everything that's and, and optogenetics. He's, he's hitting on everything that's, I guess, popular or trendy in this field. So so, uh, you know, this is this is another rising star that you guys should watch. And uh, maybe maybe we might be working together one day. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Hopefully you uh, like this kind of stuff. Hopefully I'm not going too much down the field of bioelectronics. Uh, maybe I'll go back to neuroprosthetics or brain machine interfaces a little bit more. Yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy this. And we'll come back next week maybe next week oh i think next week i'm going to be doing a live interview in england so we'll see maybe maybe not maybe it's the next week but uh that's gonna be a lot of fun i haven't done a live interview since kevin warwick captain sideborg in prague and uh that was a lot of fun i i really enjoy that a lot more so hopefully we can do more of these um well you know, I'm gonna. I still haven't done the in-person interview, but but uh, I I really enjoy. It. I know that I enjoy it. So uh, hopefully we can meet all of us. You listener too. You can. We'll find each other at you know a, a conference, and we can do an interview, or we can at least talk and just learn about each other. So hopefully you guys enjoy this, and we'll see each other. We'll hear each other next week on the Neural Implant Podcast. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.